All right, so what's a solar system? Oh, well, in this picture it looks like there's a big orange ball of gas and a bunch of little dots next to it. Yep, there's a bunch of little dots, so it's uh, sun and some planets maybe? All right, so solar systems mean there might be more than one. So for you, what is a solar system? Well, when I was growing up, it was exactly what you see in this picture. Um, it's the planets revolving around a sun. So for us, who have seen this picture a hundred times, these objects, Mercury all the way through Neptune, are gravitationally bound to the star. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means that they will maintain an orbit, basically, around the star. And they can't leave, either. That's right. So the gravity from the sun, that the sun generates, holds on to all of those planets. And has a pretty far reach, it looks like. Yeah, well, there are other things in the solar system, too, that are this, uh, under that same gravitational pull. Uh, asteroids, comets, um, any of those things are all gravitationally bound to that, basically to this system. Okay. And so for us, when you were growing up back in ancient times, uh, what was the edge of the solar system? First I was taught, hey, it's Pluto, because Pluto was a planet. That was when it was first discovered, right? Actually, yes. Um, then they said, uh, well, maybe it's like the Oort cloud, which is a lot of comets that are way out beyond okay. Pluto. So the comets were the edge of the solar system. Right. And then we kicked Pluto out, so now the edge is... No, it's still the comets. Still the comets, okay. But it's not any of those things, it seems. Okay. So what we need to talk about what people are thinking is the edge of the solar system now, the new edge of the solar system, and I put that in quotes because as of today, this could change in a couple years when you watch it. Yeah, it could. But we want to talk about the solar wind. The solar wind being the stream of particles we talked about when there's solar flares, there's constantly charged particles, protons, electrons being shot off of the surface of the sun. What's happening in that picture there? Well, it looks like they're running into a planet here. Basically what we have are we have the particles running into one of the planets that are circling the sun. So these charged particles will hit what we know as uh, our atmosphere. Yeah, our atmosphere. And it looks like it's shooting some of our atmosphere off. So if we don't have something to protect us, like Mars, we said had a weak magnetic field, it's not able to deflect these charged particles. And that's very true. But with a good magnetic field, the charged particles will um, go around the planet and continue on into space. What the new edge of the solar system is, is something we call the heliosphere. Right, and the heliosphere is those charged particles actually going further out into space than any of the things we mentioned before and coming in contact with what we know as the interstellar medium. And the interstellar medium is really just the, any matter or radiation that is between stars. So in that space where we say it's empty space, there's really stuff out there. Gas, dust, cosmic rays coming from other stars, and that hits our own sun's solar wind. Wow, so space really isn't a vacuum. Not at all. And you can see in this image here, where you said the edge of the solar system was, is right here in the center, you can see the edge of the planetary orbits, and then beyond that would be the comets, and we've got this bubble around us, this heliosphere, this shield protecting us from all those rays and cosmic material between the stars. Now it takes on this shape because our solar system, or our sun, is actually moving through space, and so it takes on this elongated shape. And you can see in this picture here, we've got Voyager 1 and 2. Voyager 1 and 2 were two spacecrafts launched in the 70s to explore the old edge of the solar system. And what just happened a few years ago is that they actually crossed this heliosphere. And they just kept on going, and in doing so, they crossed into interstellar space. So when we say that there is space between stars, and if all stars have solar winds and things like that, well, maybe all stars have planets around them. Maybe they have their own solar systems. And our sun's name is Sol, so mm -hmm. it's the system around our star. So here's another star system, which we call TRAPPIST-1. So how could we know if there are planets going around that particular star in that solar system? Well, the astronomers are going to have to come up with a couple ways to detect. There's many, many different ways to do this, but two that we can talk about are things we've already talked about in class. 
The first one is radial velocity, or the wobble of a star. Since planets have gravity, and the star has gravity, they pull on each other, and make the star wobble back and forth, creating red shifts and blue shifts. If it's the star is blue, it's coming towards us, and if it's red, it's going away from us. So in that radial velocity, in that shifting and the wobbling of a star, we can tell that there's planets there. Right. Another way to do that is to look at the light curve of the star. If the light curve dims a little bit, maybe something's going in front of it to cause that to happen. So to show you really what's going on in a light curve, we've got a couple things here for you. We've got our own photometer or light sensor, and we've got a giant light source. So what we can do with that is line up the photometer with the light source and measure the brightness of, let's say that's our star. So what you can see right now is that I'm measuring the brightness of that gigantic light. It's around 6,700 lux. And it looks like it's pretty constant. It's very constant. So how could I make this light brightness change? I don't know, maybe you could dim it by eclipsing it. So we're transing it. So mm -hmm. what that means is that something has to cross in front of it. So I've got a planet here, and I've got a planet here. And to make them eclipse, I'm gonna move them in front of the detector and have this planet cross my sun. Watch the graph now. It dropped uh, pretty significantly there. And for a very specific amount of time. Okay, so we could actually measure the transit time, and that can tell me that, hey, a planet passed in front of that star. So now I've got my larger planet gonna go in front of my star again. Let's watch the light curve for larger planets. Much more significant drop, and close to the same amount of time. Okay, so we can see a much more defined curve if it's a large planet, and maybe a just a little tiny blip when it's a small planet. So what kind of exoplanets do you think we find more often? Yeah, the big ones are easier to find because, well, they make a bigger light curve. And they make a bigger change in the light curve. So knowing this transit time, we can actually figure out the time that all these planets orbit. And for this TRAPPIST-1 system, some of these planets orbit in about a day and a half, which is really quick. How long does it take Earth to orbit once? Well, 365 days. So we're talking these planets are moving very, very fast, or what else could they be doing? Not going as far. So they're close to their star. Mm -hmm. So there's a couple things that we can at least tell that there's a planet and find its orbital time, but there's gonna be some other things we have to learn before we know exactly what these exoplanets are doing. So now that we know that there are exoplanets, we know that they're around their stars, there is this heliosphere protecting them as well. Maybe, maybe there are some rules that govern and define why planets move the way that they do. There have to be rules. It's physics. And we'll talk about those rules next time.